we're gonna get started. Maybe. There we go. All right. So let's get started. All right. Perfect. And the last thing I'm gonna do before I talk forever is I'm going to make my picture a little bit bigger so you can still see me. So the first book that I want to talk about is actually a recommendation from some of my friends in a book club that I was going to. I don't know if I would have picked it up on my own, so I'm really glad that they were able to recommend it to me. It is called The Hidden Life of Trees, What They Feel, How They Communicate, Discoveries from a Secret World, and it is by Paul Wollaben. I actually listen to it as an e-audiobook, but it is also available on Overdrive as an e-book. And then uh, when the library is reopened, you can get it in print as well. So, trees. You think you know all there is to know about trees, but you're wrong. And you're wrong because I was wrong about trees. Um, this book made me realize how complicated trees are. And I definitely didn't think that they were just passive products of their environment, but I was really surprised to learn all the things that I did not know about trees. Um, for example, anyone can kind of see that they cycle through different seasons, but there's just so much that goes into that transformation. And the trees are out there calculating and making extensive pro-con spreadsheets about when they should bloom or shed their leaves or make a new branch. Um, everything is like a 12-step process with trees. <laughs> um, they create friendships with the fungus around them and the plants that are growing nearby. And the root systems are like little resource trading highways. So trees just really function on a level that I was unfamiliar with before this book. There is actually a quote that I really like from this book that I feel like sums it all up very nicely. When you know that trees experience pain and have memories and that tree parents live with their children, then you can no longer chop them down and disrupt their lives with larger machines. So this book reads like an excited man at a party who's talking about a really specific subject that you don't know much about. Um, you can tell just from the tone of this book that Peter, who's the author, just loves trees. Like he just, he just loves them. He's inspired by them. They bring him a sense of fascination. Um, you know that secondhand excitement you get when someone's talking about something and they're clearly very passionate about it? Uh, that's how this book makes you feel. It makes you feel excited for Peter and excited for these trees and excited for the fungus around them. Um, I also think he picked a really good format for this book. It's broken down into really, really small chapters, but each chapter does a really deep dive on whatever it's talking about. So for example, there's a three or four page chapter and it is just about the fungus and how they interact with the trees. And then there's another chapter that's maybe like two or three pages and it is just about tree root systems. So it's kind of like a fun collection of brochures that Peter's just like, handing out to people. At no point does it get overwhelming, even though it does get pretty specific about the science of trees. And I know that I said I wasn't going to talk about children's books, uh, but Peter wrote a great young readers edition, and I couldn't not mention it. Um, I won't go deep into it because it is just kind of a children's version of the adult book. Um, it is called Can You Hear the Trees Talking, which is an adorable title. Um, but it's just a great book for curious young nature lovers. So I definitely just recommend it, especially if you read the book and you have someone in your life that's a bit younger. You can make your own little book club, which is very cute. So to go back to the adult version, I recommend this book because I've seen a lot of books about planting trees and taking care of trees and you know, building tree houses and gardening around trees, but this is probably one of the first books that I've seen that talks about how trees feel and how they talk to each other and how 
a tree that's in the middle of a city is more like a homeschooled kid than it is anything else. And so I feel like this book just has a really unique feeling to it that I think that everyone should experience. Um, it's just, it was just really interesting. And if you like this book, because Peter is just so overwhelmed apparently about everything in life, uh, this is actually just the first book in a loose series of books. Um, it does read as a standalone book, so if you don't want to read any of the other books, you don't lose anything by not reading them. Um, but if you are interested, here is the second book. It is called The Inner Life of Animals, Love, Grief, and Compassion, Surprising Observations of a Hidden World. And Peter just really likes hidden worlds, secret worlds, any world that you're not a part of, Peter's there. Um, Animals are a little bit easier to relate to because you can kind of see their behaviors a bit better than trees. Uh, so in this book, Peter kind of expands outwards a bit as far as his observations and you feel a little bit more involved because you kind of know animal feelings more than you know tree feelings. Uh, but to sum that up even further, the third book and the last book in the series is right here and it is called The Secret Wisdom of Nature Trees, Animals, and the Extraordinary Balance of All Living Things. Stories from Science and Observation. Peter's very big on observation. And so this last book is the whole package. It's the trees. It's the animals. It's how they all relate to each other. I've not read this book, but I can assume there's fungus in there. Mushrooms. There's all this stuff that Peter's looking at. Um, so it's just everything summed up in this really nice, neat, awe-inspired book. So this is the second book that I'm going to recommend today, and it is a book by Ed Young called I Contain Multitudes, The Microbes Within Us, and A Grander View of Life. Uh, the title refers to a Walt Whitman poem called Song of Myself, and specifically the line, I am large, I contain multitudes. So as you can probably imagine from a book that quotes a Walt Whitman poem in the title, uh, this is a very lyrically written book. There's definitely an ebb and flow uh, to the pacing of it. And I think that this quote sums up the tone of it very nicely. Um, Ed writes, when we eat, so do they. When we travel, they come along. When we die, they consume us. Every one of us is a zoo in our own right a colony enclosed within a single body, a multi-species collective, an entire world. And so Ed starts us off with animals and other organisms that we're probably gonna know and recognize uh, before taking us kind of deeper into their internal workings and an exploration of their microbiology, but then comes out again to show how everything works in this strange, wonderful ecosystem. And throughout the book, he just keeps kind of going back and forth between this really small scale and the kind of global one. Um, he does a really good point, uh, job of pointing out that microbes that affect organisms on kind of an internal scale are also the same microorganisms that affect things that are happening in the environment. And everything, is Wolbachia's fault. I don't really care what's happening. If something is happening, then that aggressive bacteria is there and is in the middle of it and probably started it. This book made me hate Wolbachia, period. So personally, I actually felt really strongly about this book, not because of Wolbachia, um, but because Ed takes the kind of deep dive into microbiology as it relates to the medical field. And towards the end of the book, he kind of brings us into this hypothetical future of what things might look like. Um, he specifically talks about the possibility of somewhere down the road, uh, scientists and doctors being able to do full uh, microbiome transplants uh, to cure digest digestive disorders. And as someone who has ulcerative colitis, which is an autoimmune disorder that affects my lower digestive system. It was just really interesting to hear him talk about it. 
and I definitely learned things about my body that I didn't know before. But I would definitely say even if you do not have a digestive disorder, this is just a really good book to learn about yourself, your microbes, and how you all kind of connect in this greater picture. It's a really beautifully written book and also a really approachable one. I feel like Ed does a really good job of using language that's both scientific and accurate, but also really wonderfully written and really approachable. And that is something I personally really enjoy in nonfiction books. I hate when a book is written kind of beyond the non-scientist reader's level, where you read it and you don't really understand what you're reading. And I, at the same time, don't really like when books are written so simply that you don't feel like you're learning anything. So I think this book does a really good job of hitting somewhere in the middle where you feel like you're allowed to learn along with what Ed already knows. So I highly recommend for anyone that's interested specifically in microbiology, but might be too intimidated by some of the other books that we have. This is the last book that I'm going to tell you about today, and it is called Cannibalism, A Perfectly Natural History. And this book was written by Bill Shook. So I want to start off by saying that when I'm not listening to nonfiction books, I am generally sticking to reading horror fiction. I just really like a good, awful, terrifying book. So I will definitely admit that I had alternative motives when I picked this book up from the shelf. But Bill called me out on it. He wrote, there is no definitive answer as to why cannibalism provides us with such stimulation. Although what is clear, and what remains extremely disturbing for me, is our increasing desensitization to violence and gore, a trade that does not vote well for the future. And I felt a little targeted, you know? I feel like Bill knows his audience. And you know what? Bill delivered a book that was about cannibalism, and he included references to human behavior. And I was honestly shocked by this book. And I was shocked because I have never read a book that takes such a violent, gory subject and makes it, like the title suggests, perfectly natural. And I was not expecting that from this book and was really pleasantly surprised. Um, Bill tells us how cannibalism can be found in parenthood with fish that will eat their young to provide nutrients to take care of the other fish. Uh, it can be found in mating rituals with certain spiders and of course the all popular praying mantis. And lastly, it can be found in human nature in ways that you really wouldn't think about. You can kind of generally expect cannibalism to be a form of violence or control or hunger, but you know, what about when it was fashionable when women would eat their own placentas? You know, that's what I thought. That's cannibalism too. And shame on us and shame on everyone except for Bill. But um, Bill doesn't stop there. No, Bill doesn't stop there. He has another book and it is called Dark Banquet. And it is specifically about creatures that exist on blood because Bill writes what he wants to write about nature. Bill does not write fluff pieces. He writes about all the awful, violent things that people want to know about, but are too afraid to ask. And for that, I really recommend, specifically cannibalism is my actual recommendation, but I would not steer you away from Dark Banquet, which I have not read, but I would really like to read hopefully soon. And if you really like his writing style, he actually does have a series. This is a fiction series. It's a thriller series. It's a, it's a three-part series. So uh, Hell's Gate is the first book. Um, Himalayan Codex is the second book. And then The Darwin Strain is the third book. So that 
thriller series is available if you are interested in some of his fictional work. So yeah, um, I wanted to wrap up actually with even more recommendations. Um, so I'm going to share some books that are on my to be read list. And so the first one is called Spineless, The Science of Jellyfish and the Art of Growing a Backbone. This is by Julie Verward. So this book is about Julie, who is a marine biologist that is no longer uh, practicing when the book is written. She's a former ocean scientist. And after she discovers some massive blooms of jellyfish that are kind of clogging up the drains and the power plants, she goes out to study them. And she meets a ton of biologists and even some who have dedicated their careers and their lives specifically to jellyfish. So this is kind of a part study, part memoir. And when I read the summary of it, it reminded me a lot of the book Lab Girl, which is also kind of a part memoir, but also part study about being a tree scientist because I read a lot about trees. So this book is on my to be read list, especially with summer coming up because I don't know a ton about jellyfish besides they are mostly water and they can sting. So I really am interested to learn more about how they function as creatures because they're creatures, which I think a lot of us forget. The second book on my TV read list is called The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator. And this is by Timothy C. Weingart. I think like jellyfish, I do not know a ton about mosquitoes besides the fact that they are awful to deal with. But this book really gets into the mosquito as king, as the whole reason that all of us are here. It really gets into that we are just all, everything we know and love is a product of the mosquito. And as much as we hate the mosquito, it is the reason we have anything good in life. So I'm really interested to see how he writes about the mosquito that will make me not hate mosquitoes because I hate mosquitoes. I attract mosquitoes, I hit mosquitoes, the cycle continues. So I'm really interested to see um, some of the examples in this book where that we wouldn't have Starbucks without mosquitoes or other things like that. And I'm just really interested to see how the mosquito became involved in any of that. And so the last book that I have on my list to be read is called Mozart's Starling. And this is a nonfiction book and it is kind of written almost like a two-part book. So the first part is about Wolfgang Mozart and how he was inspired to write some of his best works based on this pet starling that he had and kept for three years. And at the same time the book is talking about the author who has also found a pet starling and has inspired her as well. So it's this kind of dual story about multiple people being inspired by starlings. And I'm actually really interested in this, not so much because I'm interested in Mozart or starlings, but because my partner got me hooked on a podcast called The Omnibus, which I highly recommend. Um, John Roderick and Ken Jennings from uh, Jeopardy are the ones that do this podcast. And it's a bunch of interesting, obscure human knowledge. It's very science fiction feeling. Uh, I definitely recommend to listen if you have not listened already. But they have, one of their first episodes is about the European starling and how it was brought to the States because of someone that was obsessed with Shakespeare. So the Starlings are just taking over and I really want to read more about how I should fear this tiny bird. So this book is the last one on my to be read list. Um, and that was all I had for today. I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen. Awesome. So let us know in the comments or 
on our social media platforms what kind of books you guys are reading. Do you read um, nonfiction books about biology? Am I the only weirdo out here? And if so, do you have any recommendations for me? Because I'm always looking for new books. You can chat us. We're found on all of the social media pages, usually at pgcmls.info. Um, and every Thursday at noon on Twitter, there is a book chat discussion, which I tune into every week. It is hashtag PGCMLS book chat. And it is a bunch of people just kind of signing on and commenting what books they're reading and other people talking about suggestions that they should check out. So I highly recommend if you're just looking, and that's not specifically for nonfiction or biology, it's just kind of the community talking about what they're reading. So I would recommend it if you're looking for something for to read and this didn't quite tickle your fancy. It's not your cup of tea. Uh, the book chat's a really good way to get recommendations. But like I said, um, these are some of the books that I really like in that genre. So I hope that you enjoyed it as well. And um, the system will be coming out with more readers advisories. So stay tuned. Excitement and adventure are around every corner this summer at your library. Create your own literary wonderland at home. Immerse yourself in our never-ending online library. Learn new skills, explore virtual events, and connect with your community in a whole new way. Starting May 18th, the Prince George's County 